Good evening. My name is Ed McCartan. I've spent my entire career in the financial services industry starting in 1974, joining the newly introduced Chicago Board Options Exchange as an independent floor trader and then moving on to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange where I served as a governor. For the remainder of my career, I worked in larger financial institutions like Solomon Brothers, J.P. Morgan, Robertson Stevens, which was a West Coast uh, bank investment banking boutique that was owned by a major regional bank in the Northeast. I've spent my career trading in equities and their derivatives in options, futures, and in the swaps market. What I'd like to talk to you now is about the current crisis that we're seeing in the Eurozone and the potential impact that it will have on our domestic institutions. We'll talk a little bit about how contagion can spread like wildfire through these systems. Financial crisis 2.0, Europe. We're in the thick of it right now as we speak in November of 2011. What's led to this? Europe is an unusual entity in the sense that it has a common currency without having a common political system. We have 50 states, but we're United States. We do have a central bank, but we also have one united fiscal policy, which is determined in the houses of Congress. They don't always work in perfect unison. We can see that every day. But they don't work at entirely opposite purposes. In the Eurozone, you have one central bank, but you have 27 individual parliaments. They are not coordinating their fiscal policy. They are not required to coordinate fiscal policy. And each sovereign country sets its budgetary balance and its fiscal policy as it sees fit. And if Greece or Spain wants to have um, a more highly indebted economy, they can do so, whatever Germany or France might have to say about it. There are certain rules that are set by the European Central Bank over debt levels, but they were, even upon initiation of the European Union, ignored by Italy. They were skirted by Greece. Greece hid its total level of um, indebtedness through some very clever swaps transactions that were done. So. We're at the point where the European Central Bank and the, and the member states are trying to figure out what are we going to do to stop the crisis that's brewing underneath our feet. Let's talk a little bit about how we came to this. Prior to the European Union occurring, all the countries, of course, had their individual currencies. They all had their own fiscal and monetary policies. And quite traditionally, the, the countries that were on the Mediterranean periphery had a tendency to run much higher levels of debt. They ran budget deficits. Um, they were effectively running their country in a way that was a bit irresponsible and that wasn't properly taking account of the view that other investors might have of their credit worthiness. When they did get into periods of financial trouble, they basically would allow their currency to devalue and therefore to draw in investment, to draw in tourism, to make their export goods cheaper to buy, and that might slowly help them to recover and get their feet back under them again. Whereas in the northern part of Europe, and in particular in Germany, they ran highly conservative monetary policy, largely because they were the only country in Europe to experience a hyperinflation in the 1920s, when literally workers were paid twice a day because bread was so much more expensive in the evening than it had been in the morning. That's how quickly prices were moving up. And it was a catastrophic experience for Germany that they've never forgotten. The Deutsche Bank, the Central Bank of Germany, was probably the most respective sovereign uh, central bank in Europe prior to Union. 
so investors began to say, well, if all of these countries merge their currencies into a single one, then that means that the high interest countries will start to converge to Germany and their bonds will rise in price so that there's effectively one price for all Eurozone debt. This is known as the convergence trade. So the logical thing to do as a trader would be to say, I'm going to go out and buy Italian sovereign debt and Greek and Spanish sovereign debt. And when interest rates fall, those bond prices are going to rise and I'll make a profit. And yes, that is generally true. It's just bond math. And a lot of people and a lot of banks decided that they were going to do this in a very big way. And they would even use leverage to be able to amplify the returns even further. As a result today, the major banks in Europe now own $250 billion worth of this paper, specifically the, the Greek, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese and Irish debt that is so deeply underwater right now. Convergence has reversed and it's gone back in the path of the old ways, which is that these countries that ran very loose fiscal policy are now suffering with their bond prices falling in the aftermarket and it's having a really, really nasty effect because of contagion you have a, a very large amount of this sovereign paper being owned by the French banks to a lesser degree by the German banks and suddenly Europe has a banking crisis. Are they going to allow major commercial banks in their countries go belly up? Well, France doesn't have a central bank to do that anymore. Germany doesn't either. They have to look to the one bank, the ECB, to be able to make this determination if the ECB is going to act like our Fed did in 2008. Our Fed st uh, stepped in and effectively supported all of these troubled institutions after the collapse of Lehman and started to prop them up. You even had traditional investment banks like Goldman Sachs sign up and have bank charters so that they have banks and they can directly go to the Fed when they never could before. Where is the similar mechanism in Europe? And this is the debate that we've seen unfolding over recent months in Europe. How are they going to resolve this problem? We had our first casualty in the United States yesterday. A company called MF Global, which is one of a very small group of government primary dealers. A primary dealer is an underwriter to our treasury. They are the intermediary between the treasury, the United States government, and all of the institutions and individuals who buy government T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds. The primary dealers underwrite and distribute those government securities to all investors. It is a highly privileged position. It is very difficult to become a primary dealer and you're held in very high regard for the status of being a primary dealer. Yesterday, at the beginning of the business day, the Federal Reserve stepped in and said, MF Global will no longer operate as a primary dealer, and within an hour, MF Global declared bankruptcy. But why? Well, their traditional business as a futures broker fell on some fairly hard times and it's largely because of the Fed's zero interest rate policy. Commodity brokers take in margin funds from their customers and they pay out a certain amount to the exchanges. They keep the remainder on their books. They typically invest it in treasury bills so that they're earning interest on customer monies and their own funds in the market. But when interest rates go to zero, that profit opportunity is effectively wiped out. So the chief executive officer of MF Global decided we've got to find some way to be more profitable. And they went out and bought a big stake 
of these lesser sovereign bonds in the Eurozone. They bought Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, Greek debt, bought about $6.3 billion of it just as Europe became unraveled. And the losses mounted, the word of it started to get out into the marketplace, and believe me, rumors about financial distress spread like wildfire. MF Global was increasingly in trouble. Last week, their equity price dropped 50% in one trading session. And as soon as something like that happens, everyone's antenna go up. They think there's something wrong. You start getting customers pulling their funds out. But we're talking about problems in the Eurozone. And suddenly, we lost a primary dealer. And in the last two days, since that announcement yesterday morning, our stock market has fallen 4% in two trading sessions and is very, very nervous about more. This morning, the European stock markets fell even more in the opening two hours of the day because they're concerned about how this contagion begins to spread. And not just in Europe. If you have banking crises in Asia or in Europe, remember what we talked about, the nature of the global swaps market. Contagion can spill from one asset class to another, from one bank to another, and from one region to another. So the puzzle now is, what is to be done? Does, do the more solvent European countries effectively go in and say, we will guarantee the debt of Greece and Spain and Portugal? Don't worry about it. If they come up short, we'll make up the difference. But if they do that, then presumably these countries are going to be subject to some quasi-governmental authority by the lending states. Germany's not going to say, we'll lend you this money, go ahead and, and do what you did before. And if they do backstop the weaker European states, what happens to their own credit rating? Do they undermine themselves? The alternative would be, well, we have banks in our borders who hold $250 billion of increasingly falling debt. Maybe we should go out and bail them out so that they don't collapse. But if you backstop banks that are holding this paper, again, what happens to your credit ratings? And what happens to your ability to be able to deal with the consequences of the loss? Do you pass it on to your, to your citizenry? Do you start to put into place austere budgets? Do you raise taxes? The knock-on effects are very difficult to capture. It's like squeezing a balloon. If you do it in one place, a bubble swells opposite it. If you squeeze in the other direction, the bubble goes in that direction too. But there's still a bubble and there's still a problem. European leaders have been grappling with this and trying to get through their differences and figure out a mechanism to be able to get through it. But it's a very difficult problem, and it's one that requires the concurrence of 27 member states. That's not easy to do. To give you an idea of what I meant about interconnectedness, I'd like to show you a graphic from the New York Times Review. This is a map of what banks and governments in the five weak uh, economies owe each other and owe the more secure sovereign states, like Britain, Germany, and France. They're remarkably interconnected between and among them, and more distressing is that the outward arrows are pointing out to Britain, Germany, and France. These are very big numbers. Ireland, 184 billion to Germany. Spain, 220 billion to France. Italy, a half a trillion dollars to France. So the notion that the problems of these five can be contained is not likely with such enormous um, 
obligations owed to the more solvent of the sovereign nations. And when you think that included in these flows are the individual banks in these countries, it's even more problematic because those banks have massive swap agreements with banks in Asia and banks in the United States. So it truly is a global world after all, and it's one very good reason to think that the problems of the Eurozone, like it or not, are also ours.